Well, I think it's probably time to make a start. So a very, very warm good afternoon and welcome uh, from the UK. I'm conscious that for a number of people who've joined us today, I may actually be more appropriate wishing you a good morning or a good evening. But thank you so much to everybody who has joined us today for this event. My name's Neil Calvert. Some of you will know me and others won't. Um, I'm the CEO and principal of a cooperative college in the UK. Um, I've been with the college now for around 18 months. So in co-op terms, I'm still something of a newcomer. Um, although as far as education is concerned, uh, I consider myself to be something of a lifer. Um, I'm You'll probably be pleased to know I'm only going to speak very briefly today before we get into the uh, important part of today's events. But by way of some housekeeping, I do need to let you know that today's webinar is being recorded. Um, and that recording will also be shared with uh, all participants and also everybody who's registered for today um, uh, after the event. In terms of practicalities, we run a number of these kinds of events and we're conscious that our members are often keen for them to be as interactive as possible. And today is designed as an interactive event and it is important that you as the audience are keen to get involved. However, given the numbers that we're expecting today, what we have decided to do um, is to disable the chat function today as um, it was our feeling that we wouldn't really be able to keep up with quite so many people contributing with chat during the event. We do, though, want you to interact and we really do need you as audience members to ask us questions. So what you will find, for those of you who are familiar with Zoom, is that there is actually a Q&A button, which you may not be quite so familiar with. This gives you an opportunity um, to ask a question. The questions that you ask will be visible to me as the chair and also visible to our panelists. Um, we've allocated quite a bit of time for questions um, and more importantly for answers and discussion um, towards the end of today's event. Please feel free to ask the questions at any point um, during the event. We will, however, pick them up in that dedicated question time at the end. So today's agenda, well, the brief beginning really is just to paint a little bit of a picture of some context um, about the Cooperative College and who we are, um, but more importantly about today's subject, international cooperative development, and how we fit in with that. Um, we're incredibly fortunate to have a fantastic set of panellists today, um, and we want to dedicate as much time as possible to hearing from those panellists um, and learning from their experiences and their opinions about this fascinating topic. And as I've already said, we'll also allocate a decent chunk of time towards the end um, to make sure that those panellists can really give us the benefit of their experience um, and their understanding in responding to your questions and possibly to one or two of mine as well. So I've mentioned already that we are the Cooperative College. Some of you on the call know us very well. For others of you, this might be your first engagement with us. For people who have known the Cooperative College, um, we have been many different things over the years. Um, and some of you who knew us a while ago may have known a slightly different organization to the one that we are now. What we are now is a small charity, small in that we have quite a, uh, a small number of staff members. We're also an organization very keen to punch above our weight and to do so wherever possible by entering into partnerships and partnerships with people um, who can add value to us and hopefully to whom we can add value as well. As it says on the slide, we are a membership organization. It's a delight to see so many of our members um, joining the call today. Members do play, as it says in front of you, a critical role in our success in all sorts of ways. And, and those of you that are with us today, thank you. Um, today may be an opportunity to think of one or two ways in which our members might be able to contribute even more to successes in the future. And again, for people who know as well, this might not be um, news to you, but for others it will be. And we are in the early months of our current, uh, or and still what we consider to be our new um, development strategy as an organization. And you'll see that today's 
main topic, which is international cooperation, sits there as one of our four key themes. And as you'll hear and as you'll see, it's absolutely crucial to us as a, as a vital part of our work. But actually, today is an event which overlaps all four of our key themes. So although we're talking about international cooperative development, the truth is that cooperative learning, which is our distinctive approach to enabling and facilitating mutually supportive learning, also sits at the heart of everything that we do. And as you will hear, um, that approach to ensuring that people are learning in a sustainable way is absolutely crucial to effective international cooperative development. You'll also hear that working with young people is a crucial part of that work as well. And you'll see that youth empowerment is one of our key themes. And then finally, perhaps something new for the college in terms of being so overt about it, but we see we have a crucial role to play in thought leadership. And today is part of that. Um, we recognize that by providing opportunities and network and spaces for the right people to come together to ask and to answer the right questions and to engage in debate about them um, is another really key role that we can play as an organization. So today is a really important event for us and really ticks all of the boxes of everything that we do. And so international cooperative development, which you will hear much more about um, as the event proceeds, is something that, yes, is one of our main uh, four areas of work at the moment, but the college has a rich heritage in this work. And we've been a um, founder member of the Cooperative Europe Development Platform since 2008, working with strong and supportive partners from right across the continent um, on international cooperative development um, initiatives, working with cooperators and those keen to become cooperators in the global south. Right now, our biggest piece of work, um, and we're very hugely grateful to the financial um, uh, support and leadership of um, Central England Cooperative in the UK, um, enabling us to carry out this three to five year piece of work with cooperatives in Malawi, which began earlier this year, but actually has its had its roots in work the college has been doing in that part of the world since 2012, and as well as working in Malawi, also over that period, the college has worked in Rwanda, in Zambia, um, in Ethiopia, and Lesotho, among others. And I mentioned youth earlier on, another piece of work that we are um, engaged in at the moment, um, with the financial support of DGRV, um, the German Apex organization, is working to support young cooperators actually across three continents in Eswatini, in Laos, in Colombia. And for those of you who are our members, please watch this space for more information about that um, fascinating piece of work which began just a few months ago. As I said earlier on, we're quite a small organization. And as a small organization, I'm incredibly lucky that our biggest asset is our own staff. And it's going to be a delight to introduce you to one of my key colleagues shortly. And if our biggest asset is our staff, then our biggest strength really is um, in our partnerships and our friendships. So as well as introducing one of our key members of staff, it will also be a pleasure um, for me to ask Sarah to introduce three people who genuinely are strong friends and important partners to the college as well. Um, and it is this group of people on the screen with me just playing that role at the bottom of hopefully bringing things together who are going to bring some real richness, I hope, to today's event. So my colleague, Sarah Aldred, I know lots of you know Sarah very well. Um, there are some of you, obviously, who, who may not be familiar with Sarah. But Sarah is one of our longest standing members of staff. Um, her background is in the peace movement. You'll see from the slide, her PhD research was on post-conflict reconstruction. And over the last 10 years, Sarah has become a really key player um, in the UK, in Europe, and indeed internationally in this um, area of international co-op development. It's a real privilege for me to have Sarah on my staff, um, but it's also even more of a privilege for me now to introduce Sarah um, and to ask her to take this conversation forward and to introduce you to our panel members today. So Sarah, over to you. 
So thank you, Neil. Um, and yeah, and it's an absolute privilege to um, be at the college. So, um, so I think it's the next slide actually. So what I'm going to do before I, the format is going to be this afternoon is, or this morning is going to be having discussions with um, the three panelists. So, um, but before we want to do that, it's just to frame international cooperative development. So we thought we'd just put a definition up here for people who aren't familiar with what the term is. I'm just going to talk through this and just give a give a framework because this will be something that we'll be talking about over the next hour or so. So basically, um, this definition was created from the Coots for Dev team, which was a team that um, that was rooted at the ICA. Um, and over the years, and it started really um, through the Culture Development Platform, which um, is Hoano Delilo. Um, and just the definition is really, you know, we consider um, the private sector um, cooperatives as an essential player in the development field. Um, however, as cooperatives are part of both the private sector and the civil society, so that's what makes it different. There's both, there's both things, it's private sector and it's civil society. They have a unique view and impact on development processes. So that's what makes it unique, really. Um, so we believe cooperatives are ideal engines for development. So they present people-centered businesses, which empower citizens to fill their human, social, and economic rights and needs. And there again, and this, so this is definitely going to be coming up in, um, in the discussions, you know, cooperative enterprise build a sustainable, locally anchored and inclusive development process. Thanks to their business model, a very unique business model. So we just wanted to put that up there and there again, we will share this information after, um, but that just gives a context of what we're talking about today, um, which segues nicely then to, for me to introduce Luan Werner. So um, I first met Luan when um, Luan was working for Land O'Lakes, um, which is, um, um, and Luan there again, can talk a bit more about that, but um, yeah, so um, they have a huge research project across Africa um, looking at courts and developments. That's how I first met Luan. I then secondly met Luan when she said yes to be one of the cooperative women's voices. Um, so myself and a colleague um, set, uh, interview women across um, across the world. And Sarah, again, was, was one of them as well. But that's how I met Luan and she said yes um, to that. So welcome, Luan, and thank you. Um, there's two questions we've posed for you. Um, so first of all, I'd just like you to, to introduce yourself. And if you could just tell us a little bit about, you know, international cooperative, why do you think international cooperative development is different from the more traditional international development approaches? And what do you think good international cooperative development looks like? So um, over to you, Luan, and, ju and just say a little bit about yourself as well. Oh, sure. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Neil, for hosting this forum. Thanks to everyone for joining in. Uh, it is an honor to be here and to be part of the discussion with the Nilo and Sarah. As Sarah and, and Neil mentioned, I'm the Deputy Executive Director of the U.S. Overseas Cooperative Development Council, or OCDC for short. So I am from and I currently reside in Minnesota, which has a strong history of cooperatives. Uh, I have a master's in sustainable, in sustainable development um, and much of my career has been focused on supporting and managing operations of international development projects. And this includes the nine years you mentioned, uh, Sarah, working for Land O'Lakes International Development, um, working on agricultural and market systems projects across the globe. And I also led their larger agricultural based cooperative development projects in East Africa. So it's a passion of mine. Thank you for inviting me to be here to, to speak about this. And I love the definition that you, you, you shared, Sarah, of, of ICD. Um, international cooperative development is different from traditional foreign aid because it is inherently locally led and community owned. In ICD, the leadership, the ownership, decision-making and implementation resides with the local community. Mm. It's the local community, whether institutions or cooperatives that direct the activities. Those are the ones that possess the best connectedness, the capability and the credibility to drive change in their own communities and countries. So cooperatives exist in every critical sector from agriculture, which I'm familiar with, finance, insurance, energy, health, housing, and information technology. But they also operate at many levels, apex levels, uh, 
community levels, regional and national. They're all committed to meeting the evolving needs of their members, whether they range from size from 10 members to tens of millions of members. And at the OCDC, we have the privilege to champion our member organizations as they support cooperatives globally using their own expertise. And all of our members are funded by the United States Agency for International Development, or USAID. And we are really fortunate and pleased that as a funder, USAID is requiring an increase in locally led development projects globally, including cooperative support, as they see it is an important driver and platform for locally led development. And I'm gonna pull from a recently published white paper that OCDC did it's entitled From the Ground Up, Partnering with Cooperatives on Locally Led Development. There's an image of it on, on the screen and uh, a link to the paper will be shared um, in a follow-up email from this webinar. But the paper highlights how cooperatives are strong partners for locally led development. Cooperatives are sustainable, locally owned businesses. They're formed and organized from the outset, from the beginning, to mobilize their own resources and to be responsible stewards of external funding and their own internal resources to be able to scale as able. They create jobs. They stimulate economic growth, bringing needed services to underserved areas. They level the playing field. They work on building trust amongst their community members. And they're a place to practice democracy. Being member owned, they serve their own best interests, not shareholders or an owner seeking a profit. So examples, there are many to choose from, um, but to help visualize ICD projects in action, here are a few activities I pulled out from our OCDC members. I may share some later as time allows. Um, one example from NRECA, National Rural Electric Cooperative Association. Volunteer linemen from electric cooperatives in the United States joined NRECA International's projects to help support and share their expertise. They helped design, purchase, and construct a microgrid system into Tota, Liberia. This partnership provided electrification to advance the town's economic growth, serving 400 households and businesses. Health Partners, another one, a US-based health insurance provider, supports cooperatives in Uganda to establish girl centers, empowering girls and young women in their communities through mentoring, leadership, and skill building. And OCDC members, NCBA CLUSA and Global Communities, embodying the sixth cooperative principle, collaborated to facilitate cooperative policy review in Kenya holding key meetings with stakeholders, mobilizing cooperative leaders from across the country and legal experts to participate in a cooperative law reform process. As a result, several enabling provisions were incorporated into the draft national bill that promote cooperative autonomy and increase the inclusion of women and youth. Maybe one more example now. Um, to better understand the challenges cooperatives and youth face, Coffee Cooperative Manos Campesinas work with Equal Exchanges Cooperative Development Program to conduct a diagnostic survey. The results showed that youth do not participate in the cooperative because they lack the land needed to produce coffee. To identify alternatives to coffee production, the cooperative turned to the youth themselves to design and implement diversification projects, including an organic compost facility, egg production, and ecotourism initiatives. These are all examples of ICD. There's a role for various forms of development, and I have worked on traditional projects that provide training and goods to improve livelihoods, strengthen communities and countries, provide support in emergencies, et cetera, et cetera. However, when I saw, when I found international development through the lens of cooperatives, I was immediately drawn to it due to its sustainability and working on change from the community's perspective. ICD prioritizes activities and goals led by the cooperative, the community itself, equitable, inclusive, and sustainable responses to some of the world's toughest challenges are built upon the priorities, lived experiences, aspirations, as well as expertise of the people that live them every day. So further, as you, you, know, you ask, what does good ICD look like? In addition to some of the samples I mentioned, 
There are many global development challenges faced by humanity. These challenges include growing global poverty, economic disparity, instability in the financial sector, weakening of democracy, exclusion of women, massive unemployment of youth, food insecurity, climate change, digital revolution that is leaving people around the world offline. And solving all these problems takes cooperation between countries, the public, private sectors, cooperatives, and others. So I'm gonna pull from another OCDC white paper called Building a More Prosperous, Democratic, and Inclusive World, which links cooperative development and today's global challenges believing that policies that support a higher and more strategic investment in cooperative development today will in the end build a more prosperous, democratic and inclusive world in several ways. First, through cooperative support, it'll drive equitable economic growth through a people-centered and values-based business model where all, including the most vulnerable, have opportunities to improve their economic circumstances. Second, by building democracy, by providing a framework for democratic participation of members in cooperative governance and in broader public policy. And also by fostering social inclusion, by increasing trust, building social capital, and tapping the full potential of the disenfranchised, such as women and youth. My story on ICD and how I came to cooperative development, um, maybe we'll say a little bit about why I'm passionate about this um I think, yeah definitely mm -hmm. it's really it's really interesting the one actually just just some of the things and I don't want to say too much because I'm conscious Sarah and Danilo will probably touch touch on things but yeah I just think this thing around you know this people-centered locally led this this idea around you know democracy you know the heart of co-ops is democracy you know and at the minute the world is is it feels as though it's it's, it's falling through our fingers a bit really so Anyway, but that's just some some initial reflections. But so, but why are you passionate about it, then, Milan? Yeah, well, I kind I heard what Neil said. He he was uh, came into cooperatives later, and I'm a bit oh oh. I think I froze for a second. <laughs> back, back. I did not panic at all. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go off video. Can you hear me now? I've got you. I've got you. I've still yeah, got okay. You. Well, always something with technology. Um, I mean, I heard Neil say like he 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 you know didn't grow up with cooperatives, and, and I kind of resonate that with that as well. Um, instead, I found them early in my career um, when I started working for a cooperative, and once I found them, I was hooked. You know, I I stepped away from cooperative work for a bit and found I really miss this work. Mm. The field is really full of the brightest thinkers and collaborators I have ever known. Um, when I stepped away, you know, I missed it so much, it spurred me to join a board of a credit union myself. And then I was lucky enough to find my way back to the bright side by working at OCDC. Brilliant. Well, thanks, Luana. And just, you know, we'll come back to you. And, and Neil, have you, before I move, move on to Danilo, um, have you got any reflections or questions? Um, because but, but we will come back to you, Luan. We will come back to you. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Luan, thank you so much. Uh, for me, loads of food for thought there. Um, and I guess, you know, you've all just mentioned again the fact that I've already said I'm relatively new to co-op still. And one thing that I find fascinating is your reference to working with um, organizations outside the co-op sector in order to uh, affect some of the um, ICD projects you've been involved in so particularly working with government and I think that's something that it would be interesting to explore the extent to which that provides both challenges and opportunities and also um, if I understand you right working with um, non-cooperative um, private sector corporate organizations as well so I don't really want to spoil the flow at this stage, and I'm key, uh, conscious we've got two more panellists to hear from, but I think those are areas that it might be interesting to um, to sort of drill down into a little bit um, sure. further on. So, Luan, thank you so much. Sarah, I'm going to hand back to you to introduce our next panellist. So, um, Danilo, um, so on to the next slide. There you are. 
So Danilo, um, so I've known Danilo since 2012 when I first came to the Cooperative College um, and it was through the Cooperative Development Platform. So my former, um, my, my former boss, um, Dr. Linda Shaw, um, was a founder member um, of um, the uh, Cooperative Development Platform. So she introduced me to Danilo and the rest of the team. So I've known Danilo a long time um, and he's an expert in international quality development, was headed up um, Copa Mundo um, in Italy and then um, you've moved over to the ICA America. So it's an absolute delight. First of all, just thank you for saying yes um, and thank you for being here. Um, and Danilo, um, that's really similar, really similar to the questions I've asked the one. You know, can you just talk a little bit about yourself, also your motivation, what's, what's motivated you for being working in this field of international quality development and what's some of the added value that co be it that cooperatives give to development? Over to you. Thank you, Sarah, and uh, good morning and afternoon, everyone. And thank you for this invitation that gave me the possibility to tell a bit more about my personal uh, story within the cooperative movement and international cooperative development, and uh, to also to strengthen this uh, important partnership we have between the college and uh, uh, Cooperative Saudi America. Uh, at the moment where uh, I'm serving as a regional director. I assumed I was, uh, I was appointed as a regional director in 2018. Uh, before that, as you said, Sarah, and you remember very well, <laughs> with a, a little bit of nostalgia, I would say, uh, I was travel. I was working uh, at Copermondo, which is the NGO of uh, Conf Cooperative Italia, and uh, I also served at uh, Eurix. I helped Eurix uh, to uh, to set up to move the the first steps uh, with the Latin American networking of uh, cooperative researchers here. Uh, here where I am, because I'm, I'm, I'm in Costa Rica, where the uh, regional office of the IC America is based. So uh, it's 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 a pleasure uh, again. Um, so uh, what? How we started? Let's say. Uh, let's let's uh, let's uh, start from here. How we started? Uh, here you have, and thank you, Neil, for moving the slide. Uh, once again, uh, I will say. Uh, it started incidentally, uh, but uh, then uh, amongst uh, parentheses, you have the, the, the Spanish wording for casualty uh, does not exist, uh, a word or a model uh, I learned here uh, in, in the Americas. So uh, it started incidentally to me, uh, my commitment to uh, cooperatives and international cooperative development began uh from at the at the end of the 90s uh 90s uh, where uh, at that time i was working as volunteer in a um, fair trade uh workshop uh and uh, it's it's funny for me to remember that uh, i was uh, in charge my responsibility let's say was to work in the warehouse unpacking all the goods coming from the global south and uh I had time, a part of this, uh, uh, a part of uh, unpacking and putting the, the, the goods on the shelf. Uh, I was, I had time to, to, to read the, the, I was curious at the time to read the uh, packaging. Speaking about, uh, uh, let's say the producers, uh, where the goods were made, and uh, how uh, the producers were organized. And uh, I was, really i got curious about this organization uh i heard for the very first time they were member the producers were um, mostly member of cooperatives this uh business organization uh, uh community hold as Luan said and uh able to run the organization and able to uh, take their own decision in a democratic and very participatory way uh, and they receive. They were able to receive from the fair trade global uh, um, cooperative movement. They were able to 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 receive a fair price for their goods. So it, it was very attractive to me. Very very interesting. So my um, let's say motivation 
as uh, uh, volunteer uh, was growing and uh, I decided to uh, make my thesis uh, with a field work uh, in Chile. Uh, but before that, and before going to Chile at the end of, of uh, 1998, 1999, um, I, I I was at the at this uh, uh, fair trade uh, cooperative uh, in the in in Italy, and uh, and the name of the of the national organization was Altermercato. Here you have the logo. It's playing. Uh, Altermercato uh, is a word which is upside down. No, uh, as you can see, uh, another market where the the the, the word market is upside down. So to me, it was very interesting, the idea of uh, looking at the world and um, um, looking at a, 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 um, a development paradigm uh, where uh, the excluded one, the one who had no voices so far, uh, can, can and could uh, take the lead and uh, raise their voice, uh, take action and let's say foster the uh, future so this is my this was my first uh, uh, motivation my first idea uh, this idea became a job uh, alongside uh, uh, the time and this job is uh, nowadays uh, still made of uh, a big big portion of passion and this deep sense of justice uh, still there, uh, motivating myself that uh, I, I, I moved and uh, I took over this regional office. Uh, I have the honor to, to, to live here uh, from Costa Rica as part of the ICA family. So what motivated me most, let's say, uh, and we can go to the next slide maybe, uh, I think the people, um, the people, uh, before uh, reaching the uh, joining the, the ICA uh, family from uh, a European point of view, uh, being part of the uh, fair trade Italian cooperative movement uh, was very motivating to me. Also, because I met a lot of people, the volunteers at the workshops, the customers, uh, the founders, and the, some ambassadors of the fair trade movement. I was particularly impressed by. Uh, two of them. The first was uh, Rigoberta Manchu Tum, the Nobel Prize, the Guatemalan woman. Uh, and uh, I met her uh, at the very beginning as uh, uh, I, I was in charge for uh, cooperative education or fair trade education. And we made a, a communication campaign where she was uh, our ambassador speaking about uh, of course, um, indigenous people to uh, to take the lead, to to raise their voice, and to foster the the future. And uh, the the second one who particularly impressed me was a, a guy uh, from Brazil who was used to spend the summertime coming from Brazil to the national warehouse at uh, Altro Mercato. Uh, unpacking, uh, volunteering as well, but uh, especially uh, exchanging and study the movement, the Italian corporate um, fair trade uh, movement, because he had this idea to adapt or export some experience in uh, in Brazil. And uh, this guy at the beginning of, uh, let's say this guy then became famous <laughs> And I realized uh, uh, many years after that, that uh, his name was Inácio Lula da Silva, which is uh, uh, Inácio Lula da Silva. I mean, uh, the, the person who was uh, two times president of Brazil and uh, uh, he won the uh, election more recently. So people was people were uh, the, the, the main factor that motivated me most in engage more and more and this belief in a in a better future for uh, for uh, the, the 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 excluded one, the global South people, and uh, in the poorest one. Then I joined the uh, the the cooperative movement from a European point of view. As a work, I was used to work uh, in Italy at Copermondo, and it was very nice to be part being part of this uh, CDP cooperative Euro development platform. 
with these people you see uh, here on the screen. Uh, uh, the CDP is a platform made by um, a cooperative organization from all over the countries of Europe. And uh, uh, we were used to have one person in charge for international development, as myself at that time, as uh, uh, other amongst them, uh, Sarah and, and, and Linda Shaw, and, and the other, uh, I remember, uh, with uh, very, very uh, passion uh, and a uh, nice recording about that time. Uh, so we we engaged uh, a lot, and we we, we were able to to push and, and fill a gap existing at the moment to put the international cooperative development at the heart uh, of our respective organization, and then uh, uh, at the heart of um, the IC uh, the ICA. Um, this small group of people grew, uh, grew up. And next slide, please. And uh, uh, here we have some picture of the uh, cooperative summit in Quebec 2016, where the international cooperative development platform, the first step uh, was made. Uh, you can see uh, and recognize the employee green, of course, then Dr. Linda Shaw, uh, amongst others, and a very nice companion uh, of, our, of this uh, personal and professional trip. Next, night, uh, next slide, in 2017, we set up formally the ICDP in Kuala Lumpur at the uh, ICA uh, General Assembly in uh, late November. Polizen amongst them, Sarah was there, and a lot of uh, people, Andreas Kapper and uh, Francesca from Lega Cop and uh, Stefani Marcone and uh, others. So uh, we arrived uh, at the very uh, next slide, please, Neil, uh, uh, in Buenos Aires at the uh, ICA General Assembly. We, uh, from the Americas, uh, I, I was already appointed as regional director. We decided to set up a similar platform from the Americas, where uh, a cooperative organization uh, from the Americas uh, engage in international development, set up this uh, platform uh, like the CDP, the Cooperative Zero Development Platforms, as part of the global one, uh, the International Cooperative Development Platform to, to, uh, to exchange uh, methodologies to, to try to set up joint projects uh, for international cooperative development. It was a milestone for us uh, at the moment. And in 2019, at uh, the GA in, uh, in, in Rwanda, in the next slide, you can uh, also see uh, our picture. So uh, our, uh, yes, nice moment in, 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 this, uh, in this voyage to uh, the international cooperative development. So um, this is the, 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 the nice part of the story, the, 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 the very first uh, steps. And uh, with the next slide, we can uh, move uh, about another point, another uh, topic that uh, motivated me most. Uh, maybe uh, the main one uh, um, still moving me, uh, or that is being part of this international organization, this global actor uh, like the ICA, uh, which is internationally recognized, uh, promoting social justice, uh, a more fair or sustainable, inclusive uh, development. And this, uh, being part of this organization funded uh, at the end of the 19th century, is uh, um, really uh, uh, an asset uh, to us because uh, we have the opportunity to have uh, direct dialogue with all international partners. Uh, here you have uh, the uh, logos of the organization we have signed, uh, MOU and uh, uh, partnership here in the Americas. So it's we are uh, really uh, to, uh, taken into consideration when we want to set up a development project, when we want to engage in some specific fields or uh, topic uh, here in the Americas, but uh, worldwide uh, through the, uh, the ICA. And then maybe the uh, with the next slide, uh, the, 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 the biggest motivation is to tackle and, and uh, to engage in order to try to uh, con give my contribution to uh, reduce uh, inequalities. 
worldwide, but specifically uh, in the Americas. Because with the next slide, we can see uh, some figures uh, speaking about the Americas. The Americas, uh, our, this continent is the most unequal uh, region of the world. And uh, especially due to the pandemic uh, in, the, in the last uh, two or three years, we saw uh, the level of poverty and extreme poverty uh, coming back uh, to the levels of the uh, last 10 slash 15 slash 20 years. Uh, because, um, because of several factors. I mean, I mean there is uh, uh, inequalities are uh, uh, this characteristic of the region. And uh, but uh, um, from 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 every angle, uh, I will say. And the, uh, with the next slide, I can quote some uh, and, and give an example of some uh, on inequalities here in the Americas. For instance, we uh, we remember during the pandemic, during the lockdown, uh, people were used to 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 go to school at distance of uh, virtual modality, but we have to remember that there's a gap to the access of, of the internet and to the education. And here you have the picture and the cost of inequality in Latin America. On the left side, you have uh, a family, uh, children from uh, a family in, in, in Brazil. And then you have a picture on the right, uh, typical picture uh, we're used to experience uh, during the pandemic in, the, in, in, in Europe or in, in the global north, I would say. Uh, but to give you uh, an idea uh, about uh, inequalities in Latin America, uh, I, I used to quote some figures here. Uh, the Pan American um, Health Organization, the, the regional uh, expression, the regional office of the WHO, says that uh, in the Americas there were uh, 187 million people uh, who contracted COVID. Uh, from the uh, beginning of the pandemic, and we have 2.8 million people uh, died because of the COVID. Uh, and uh, again, this is the, the region most affected by the COVID uh, during the last uh, three years. Uh, the UN ECLAC, the, uh, the uh, UN Com Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, says that uh, in the last three years, uh, poverty uh, reached the 33.7% of the population, almost uh, 220 million people uh, get into poverty condition, and plus, I would say, 15% uh, of the population are in, uh, living in extreme uh, poverty condition. Mm -hmm. um, more uh, about these uh, figures uh, about inequalities in the Americas. The ILO uh, reported uh, a couple of months ago that um, after the pandemic with the recovering, uh, there was uh, uh, the, a recovery of most of the job, uh, but with a gender gap. Uh, only the 60% of um jobs led by women were uh, recovered while uh, the uh, men uh, came back to the uh, uh, condition uh, job condition and employment condition before the pandemic and another thing another topic affecting the, the region is informality one people out of two is working at informal level selling goods in the street so you can uh, understand easily understand how the pandemic uh, meant uh, uh, for people here in the America uh, obliged in lockdown uh, condition, uh, having no uh, possibility to work and to have uh, money and to buy food. Uh, and especially for the children was very um, hard as uh, they didn't come back to school uh, in a in a in a in a good in a big percentage uh, as they had to uh, help their relatives uh, selling goods uh, in the streets so tracking uh, working against this condition 
uh, against uh, inequality was maybe what motivated me most. And now, uh, mm -hmm. what's the added value of uh, the cooperative, international cooperative development to me? With the next slide, please, uh, Neil, if you can help me next, please, again. Okay, uh, once again, being, uh, and first of all, being a global network, uh, we have the opportunity to uh, work together as we are part of the same global organization. It's very easy to us, for us to get in touch and to exchange methodology and to set up a development project uh, because we have uh, as ICA members in more than 113 uh, countries of the world. So there is an added value uh, at all. Uh, we can do international development projects and uh, uh, in every sector, uh, economic sector, and we can organize the project uh, by economy of scale, uh, reducing costs uh, like for uh, an operational uh, headquarter or uh, office uh, abroad. And, and we can do, um, cooperative development via COP to COP, cooperation amongst cooperatives. Uh, as uh, a part of that, uh, we are a reference for our uh, partners and donors as we are um, organization uh, funded um, uh, in, in cooperative values and principles, and we have sectorial capacity uh, we can mobilize for uh, these projects. Uh, with the next slide, I will also to stress um, the lessons learned uh, alongside these uh, years. Uh, the EU uh, partnership, the partnership with the EU was uh, an, uh, an added value. We do need another partnership with the EU uh, to strengthen our capacity for delivering uh, international development program. Mm -hmm. uh, we do need to connect the beneficiaries uh, of our international development uh, programs to the uh, APEX organization, uh, becoming members uh, of the APEX and do, uh, of the Federation in order to uh, strengthen them and to protect them uh, during the, the, the time. And we have to improve cooperation amongst cooperatives. Uh, these are my, my, my points. I want to thank you with the next slide uh, for this partnership, for this opportunity. And uh, here I am for any, for any uh, questions you have from the side. Thank you, Danilo. And that was, that was incredibly rich. Um, and there's so many questions um, that I'd want to throw at you, um, but I'm not going to do it just yet. But I just some some I, I mean I think I'm probably most hit because it's most recent really just around the COVID figures really you know in terms of the region and the deaths and things and how and that you're the informal economy you know and uh, how people being pushed into the informal economy really and how co-ops can really help with that so um yeah and I think we're probably potentially going to come we'll have a discussion potentially about include about inclusion um and inequalities as well really because that's a theme that keeps coming up really but um, I'm just conscious of time, much because we do want to get to some questions, Daniel. But honestly, that was that was incredibly rich, and thank you for that, and thank you for kind of um, yeah, just sharing that. So, Neil, any any reflections and thoughts before I move over to Sarah? Sarah. Yeah, just very briefly, Sarah, Daniel, thank you so much for that. I think what came out to me, and I'm sure to most of the people on the call, if not everyone, was the really strong thread around providing voices, you know, for, for the unheard and for the excluded and that commitment to inequality. And I think it is going to lead into a question that I'll just sort of prepare all the panellists for. Um, I think there is a question, therefore, around what we do if we're trying to facilitate international cooperative development in societies that perhaps don't share values that we're familiar with and therefore we're working in countries where we still perceive some inequality. And, you know, I'm sure I'm not the only football fan on the call today, but clearly people who do know uh, anything about how football's been in the news recently will understand some of the debate around holding an international tournament in a country that that maybe doesn't share values that some of the Western nations um, might. And I guess there are therefore some challenges around if we're doing this kind of development work in countries where maybe there is an inbuilt gender gap or there are 
attitudes toward towards LGBT, LGBTQ communities, or perhaps there are fewer opportunities for disabled people. You know how we deal with those kind of challenges when you know many of the people doing this kind of work, Danilo, are just as driven as you are um, around this. You know important thread about equality. And interestingly, one of the questions that has come in during um, during the, the, the uh, inputs from our first two speakers has been about, you know, how to invigorate a cooperative system in a country where um, it's politically difficult to do so, and particularly in respect of Uganda, the question has come in. So I think there are some interesting questions there about the tensions between a clear commitment to equality and how that actually plays out in practice. But um, I'm, I'm, I'm warning the panelists about that question. I'll ask it again <laughs> when we've heard from our last panelist. But, but uh, Danilo, that was great. Thank you ever so much. Um, Sarah, I'm going to hand back to you. So thanks. Um, thanks, Neil. And um, last but never least, um, so Dr. Sarah Kari. Um, there again, Sarah, just huge thank you for saying yes and welcome and welcome to today. Um, and just a, a brief introduction, really. So I've known Sarah since 2013. Um, so we worked on a, um, well, I was, um, I came into the college to, to lead on a project in Malawi and Sarah came on a joint um, postdoc um, research project in partnership with the Open University. And I think we've got Hazel, uh, Hazel here today. Um, so welcome, Hazel. Um, and also we've got our new colleague, um, Jackie, um, who used to work at the Open University. So, um, you know, there's strong links there to the Open University, just, just to give that a nod. But yeah, so we worked from 2013 um, on the, um, in Malawi. Um, and then since then, um, and we've got lots of stories to tell of that Malawi um, experience, but you've, you've gone from strength to strength. You know, you've, you've worked with the FAO, you know, you know, you've set up around the world, which is an inspirational kind of, um storytelling um project well it's more than a project really so it's, it's, a, it's a it's a complete thing now so um sarah just a couple of questions for you then um is um why are you passionate about international quality development um and what kind of insights from your vast experience have you you know, because you've done your PhD on cooperatives, you, you, you've done it in Brazil, you know, so what, what insights have you gained from your experience? So over to you, Sarah. Thank you very much, Sarah, Neil, and the Cooperative College uh, for this invitation. Uh, I'm very, I, every time I come back to you, to the, to the college, I feel home, so it's always been very nice for me to be with you and uh, here with all these uh, speakers. Um, well, so where does this question come from? Uh, it's a long story, dates back uh, 2000, when uh, I was in uh, Brazil uh, to carry out my, at the time, my bachelor. Uh, so I wanted to do uh, field work for my research activity, uh, my uh, first touch as a researcher. And um, I was welcomed by a movement of uh, women um, rural workers. So, um, and was very, very uh, interesting uh, for me, uh, living with them for a few months in this uh, amazing, you can see, uh, pre-Amazonian uh, forest. Um, I've always been interested, actually, in a uh, women's collective action. So cooperative was not uh, really my topic. And uh, so it's weird because of course, as Italian, we have a very strong movement, but it never happened to me. I, mean, I was not uh, familiar with the topic. But there, there in Brazil, I discovered how powerful they are in transforming people's lives. Um, and so since then, I mean, that, that became uh, then my passion, uh, my, my story of life. Um, and you know, I mean, that story and then exactly this first experience uh, for me was really a kind of school of international cooperative development. That's where I've learned all most of the, uh, I mean, the lesson that then I brought with me in all the assignment, because then, of course, as you say, they continue with the cooperative college, with the Lega Corp uh, in Italy, um, then with the United Nations, uh, in FAO, working with FAO as independent consultant, as an international consultant, uh, as a researcher with the universities, also in Rome. 
But then, I mean, really, uh, everything for me started there. And in a nutshell, the story, you see now, I mean, these were our participatory action research uh, tools, but their story is also depicted in most of these pictures. Uh, Danilo was talking about inequality and Brazil as a huge story of inequality. Um, very unequal society, particularly in terms of land distribution. And during the 80s, basically, uh, these communities organized themselves through, um, so they came together into collective action to access land and also, especially, to access this natural resource, this palm called Babasu palm, uh, because that was at the base of their livelihood. And, um, and landowners uh, kept on uh, fencing off. Uh, the lands and pushing them back, and uh, of course, it was also violence. It was very violent conflict. But then, basically, uh, this collective action uh, story uh, evolved, and uh, they organized kind of economic system. So after accessing land, after accessing this, uh, managing to access the natural resources, they needed also to free themselves from dealers, and dealers were the loan donors uh, again, so very low price. And it was interesting, I mean, actually my storyteller, um, I mean, vocation started, uh, has always been with me. I remember being with the camera at that time, not of course professionals, professionals and dress one, but uh, still I was there with the recording their voices. And that was uh, telling me, uh, for me, uh, for, for us, they were telling, um, at the beginning, we didn't call it uh, a cooperative. We were doing a commercialization, commercialization. Because basically what they needed was to free themselves from the, from the dealers. And they wanted to do it together. Then they discovered that what they doing, were doing was the cooperative form of business. And I think this is very, very interesting. And being there with them, of course, then I carry out the PhD with them, several research projects. I found out how, um, I mean, we could, and I mean, uh, also with them or with their stories, um, was documented to see how participating in this cooperative changed all the well-being they mentioned in terms of food security, nutrition, um, access to education, access to education for their children. So uh, also, um, I can say, stopping an inter intergenerational transfer of poverty. Um, but also, and very interesting, this collective action developed agency of people. So now they became leaders and, uh, and they, they, the kids, now are very important leaders uh, that went to the university and are keeping on this, uh, this story of fight. Uh, some of them uh, we, we met uh, when we came back to the Land World project uh, to, to meet with them. Um, and I was saying, I mean, why this story for me was kind of a, a school of international crop development. Um, because I've, I've seen them also, I mean, when I stayed with them, I, had, I was very lucky because they really opened their doors to me. For a long time, and uh, I, I could see really them also negotiating food donors, and I could see them discussing the projects in the communities. And uh, so, one of the key lessons learned that I think I brought with me then in the, all the work that I carry out is about uh, principle four. Uh, I think that principle four mm -hmm. is, is, is very strong in international co-op development. It's about autonomy and independence. And it's not only from the government. There with them I learned that it's also from donors. It's also from all the players that interact with cooperative. It's about the kind of power relation that you create with, the, with those that are supporting you. The importance of involving community in deciding what is needed, what is not, uh, and uh, identify priorities. So I think that this is very important in uh, international development, but when it's about co-ops, and, and, and particularly when you have co-op to co-op relations, this is really a principle for uh, uh, brought to life, no? and um, living, living the principle. It's also in the, the way that the relation in, uh, is developed among the partners. Mm -hmm. um, and connected to this, probably, this is a reflection that I make as a more as an independent researcher. But we have seen this in Malawi, we have seen this in several countries. There is a big problem of when uh, cooperatives are created as exit strategies or projects, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, another lesson that I learned is that cooperatives, uh, I mean, cooperative development is a process. So it's not really, you cannot just create, it's not the act of registration of the cooperative that you just do at the end of the project. Most of those cooperatives fail 
we all know very well that uh, we're in the field. Uh, but uh, it's very interesting when you see instead that you have this collective action that then uh, through leaders and through this connection and through this uh, bridging and learning and uh, linking uh, channels uh, and uh, relations and connections then came to life uh, to a whole, a whole story of uh, local development. Mm -hmm. um, and so probably um, now I mean just to share two other uh, stories from the Around the World uh, School project. So this one, of course, you can find this story of Brazil in a YouTube the story. Uh, but I mean, in Around the World of Coop, we tell story of uh, COP development of this kind of local development process. And uh, by the way, just uh, um, we, we combine uh, video making with uh, participatory action researchers, where I have a researcher uh, where are uh, the people, the members that decide how to tell the story and they define the story and they tell them in person, they, they story. And uh, uh, Danilo made me thinking when he was uh, before saying how everything started for him. Because if we think it started because of a tool of communication, because of the packaging, I mean, because fair trade clearly tells story, stories on, uh, on the product. And this came up as a tool of inspiration. So I kept, I mean, what's the vocation, the mission that we feel now we have with the, around the world of Coop is really to make, um, to contribute, because of course uh, the Coop movement is really doing a lot internationally, but to contribute to communicate the power of cooperatives, the power of Coop identity in transforming and inspiring people. Uh, I mean, again, I mean, Danilo is really a kind of um, very inspirational what you say, because is in a way also a justification for what I mean, what we are doing, no? to inspire people, and to have the possibility also through storytelling of of communities inspiring each other, which I think is even more important, where you have different communities that are listening to the stories of others can inspire themselves about how to engage in their local endogenous development process. Um, going back to Morocco then, um, this is very, um, we, we had their uh, carrying out research because as I said, we started the carrying out research and then filming. Uh, was very interesting to listen to them, how the story started. Mm. So this is different, very patriarchal society. There was not the kind of strong social capital that was in, in Brazil. Um, it all started because uh, with the women that could not uh, uh, have any control of their production. So uh, they are organ oil uh, producers, but all the production was uh, under the control of men. Uh, but then a very uh, inspired uh, and visionary uh, young lady from that community that had the, the chance to study uh, came back from the city to the village and started inspiring the other women, uh, creating you know literacy literacy uh, classes uh, to let them uh, go out their houses and start creating that bonding uh, relations among them. And little by little, little by little, this is the story nowadays of a very uh, strong cooperative that sell their oil, their products with their um, name labeled as a Tudarte, that means life, and uh, having um, commercial relations with big buyers like uh, L'Oreal. Mm -hmm. And with women now that they travel, with uh, women that now, I mean, uh, completely change relations at home with their husbands, so, and also going back to the Neil question, it is interesting to see that the change of mentality is a long process. And, uh, and it's very interesting here to see how this change of mentality started because of one of the person of the village that believed that had a vision and little by little and particularly through education managed to uh, create kind of role model for women that then inspire other women and this created a change in a, in a community, uh, in a region. These are pictures of uh, our uh, focus groups before the filming uh, there in, uh, in Morocco. Um, and this is also the, the, one of the main characters from the main members telling stories uh, in the video. So in our YouTube channel, you find all these videos if you're interested. 
And, and of course, they are open source, so feel free to use also in your training, your call with, with in your cooperatives or all your activities. Uh, so let's move now to Rwanda, another country, another context. Again, completely different here. Not only we didn't have, there was not strong social capital at the beginning of this COP story, but to, the, 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 the cooperatives started after the genocide. So with a disrupted uh, social relation, not so. I am, and here for me it was very as a researcher, particularly, it was very interesting to learn from this story, because here uh, this cooperative started with a massive uh, role of uh, donors, and uh, as we said, some top-down stories might fail. But why this cooperative didn't fail? This is what they told us: they receive an. Uh, a lot, lot, lot of training. Training not only in um, technical skills, hard skills, but training in uh, governance, training in understanding the, the role of the import, the role of being a member, uh, uh, training on governance, training on uh, COP identity. So really creating and uh, lighting up the passion on what they were doing. And, um, and so this basically by working together members uh, manage to recreate the social cohesion that was totally disrupted with the genocide, but uh, not only that. So they created one of the best cooperatives in Rwanda uh, nowadays. And also in terms of very strong and sustainable and financially viable. Uh, so they also uh, invested from only uh, rice producers. So they became kind of a um, really entrepreneur in the um, um, setting up uh, a hotel, a restaurant, uh, so mm -hmm. in the service sector, so, so moving to the service sector. Um, and so now they are also and definitely uh, more resilient. Uh, uh, and with, uh, uh, with strong investment in training, I was missing to say also in terms of management and uh, uh, accountable management uh, uh, for that cooperative. So I think these were all insights that uh, um, for me was, uh, was very, very uh, interesting to, to bring with me in all the other assignments. And I think so particularly that um, uh, international co-op development has the opportunity uh, not only to rely on uh, principle six, that is collaboration among cops, not only uh, about uh, principle seven and all the other principles, but uh, I mean, uh, it's, it's a principle that we, mm, we don't speak about very often, but I think it's very, very, very important. That is in terms of equal power relations among partners. So where really cooperates then are a driver of uh, uh, local uh, endogenous uh, development. Um, so thank you very much and um, happy to continue this conversation. Thank you, Sarah. I mean, the, the, and the images are amazing. And for anybody who's not had access to aroundtheworld.coop, I absolutely kind of recommend you go on there. And, and there's, there's, there's so many rich um, videos on YouTube as well. But, but thank you for that. And it's really interesting because, like you say, Sarah, not many people talk about Principle 4, about that independence and autonomy. And I'd be quite around and also around the role of the donor, you know, in that. And it'd be interesting probably with, with Luan as well, what, what some reflections are there. Um, but yeah, it's it's power, power that we could talk for hours about power and power relationships and things. So, but that came across really strongly there. So anyway, I'm conscious of time, but I, first of all, all three of you, I just want to say a huge thanks. So they're all very different. And I and that's, that's, that's why it's been really rich, really. And thank you so much. For that, I'm going to hand over to Neil now um, because he's going to ask some questions, feel some questions. Um, but just a huge thank you. And it's there again, this is the first time we've done this webin for this kind of webinar around international property development. So it's so it's so it's an absolute privilege to kind of for you all to say yes. Anyway, before I keep going on, Neil, over to you. Thank you, Sarah, and and thank you so much, Sarah, for that. And just a very brief reflection on your um presentation from me before we get into some questions. I was really fascinated and inspired to hear you talk about agency and about, um, you know, children as leaders becoming the first generations and their families to go to university and so forth. And, and as a learning organization, you know, this is kind of the holy grail for us at the moment as, as the cooperative college is to 
is to join together the work that we do in international cooperative development with the learning work as well. And, you know, we are talking with partners about the potential to provide formal routes into education for some of our um you know icd project participants so so it was fascinating absolutely fascinating to hear that um and i should also say that your storytelling approach has been something of an inspiration to us as well as we as we look to improve our own practice in communicate in measuring impact but more importantly in communicating impact to others um you know to to ensure that we're able to to, to spread the word and 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 so forth and your you know your work has been an inspiration to some of the developments that we're making at the moment so again thank you to all three panelists um i've certainly been given loads of food for thought there we've got one or two questions that have come in from the audience as well but please audience members um we are a little bit tight for time but please put questions into the q a if you would like um our panelists to answer them and i've got a couple to start us off um which i've sort of teed up already so the first one i guess probably goes to Luan and to Sarah initially, because you've sort of given us two sides of the same coin here, and that Luan, as I mentioned earlier, I was fascinated to hear your experiences of working with government aid and potentially also with um, donors from outside of the sort of co-op ecosystem. Um, and clearly there are opportunities that stem from that, but maybe also challenges. Um, and then, Sara, your your fascinating sort of references to principle four there, you know, are reminding us that there is a crucial element to this, which is about enabling autonomous solutions um, for the participants in the project, for the beneficiaries. So I guess the question to both of you, and I'm happy, you know, for either of you to, to start off and for you to support one another or argue with one another or however you want to do it. I'm interested to know what are the challenges posed um by working in a way that might not be considered pure international cooperative development in the sense that there are actually donors that might be government or might be private sector that may be attached some strings you know and are the challenges of that sufficiently outweighed by the benefits sorry that's a very long-winded question but i'm hoping you you both understand where i'm going with that and i'd be interested in your thoughts on it please oh thank thank you neo i'll i'll take a, a stab at it my internet holds here uh, really yeah I, I agree i i learned a lot from from the other uh for sharing their expertise I'm having uh, difficulty with my Zoom, so maybe I'll, I'll let Sarah yeah, Luan, back can... and, and respond later. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, you've just broken up a little bit for us, Luan, but hopefully we can we can bring you in again uh, in a minute or two. Sarah, any any thoughts from you? Well, yes. Uh, one thought that comes to my mind uh, that is also linked uh, to again back to this uh, importance of storytelling approach is about. Is the question to what extent other people, other actors know about cooperatives? Uh, we all know that we are bringing on our shoulder a very bad legacy. Um, and I think that uh, one of the challenges is really to be sure that the other partners outside the COP movement understand about cooperatives. This, I think, is, is, is a huge challenge. Um, and because very often other partners approach cooperatives with a lot of preconception. So, uh, or, or simply uh, misunderstanding. So I would say that uh, one could be one of the challenges about that. And then of course is creating a platform or opportunity or forum or occasion for a proper dialogue, uh, particularly when it's about uh, organizations and government. Or, so it's really creating the space for that dialogue to happen. Uh, and, and then I think is also, a very too often the that space is lacking so is another challenge that i would say uh is there that are the two that comes to my mind as an independent observer but as a researcher but i think that uh, uh, luana and danilo have uh, more insights because they are into it <laughs> yeah that's very interesting thank you and um luan i don't know whether you're able to step back in or, or danilo whether either of you've got anything to wow. add to that at all 
I will try. I must say, uh, my, my furnace stopped working this morning, so maybe it is freezing my modem too. I don't know, but uh, we'll we'll sort it out after this. Um, but I, I, on my side with the U.S. policy, I I think um, it is a huge benefit to us um, at OCDC and our members that they value locally led development. Um, and we are directed and guided by US policy on inclusivity. Um, now how that, that works in actually implementing our projects, um, I guess as, as I agree with what Sarah said, like it's, it, is a, it is a process. And I would say cooperatives are not the, the golden egg or you know, one size fits all solution. They are work and, and they take time. And um, probably, you know, just my, my theory too is, is why traditional aid maybe didn't focus on cooperatives as much because because of the time it took to to see the results and, and measure, measure the change. Um, so I think we're kind of on, on the cusp of, of getting it right here in the US and and doing policy right. Um, and I've seen some some of our members even doing some innovative stuff with inclusion, particularly in gender. You know, Land O'Lakes Venture 37 in Rwanda, they did a, a trading places kind of activity with husbands and wives um, swapping roles for a couple of days and, and seeing what it, what it takes to, to run a household. Um, so there is more of that innovation coming out of, uh, out of our members in particular, which, which I'm proud of. And um, yeah, and, and you know, I, Sarah kind of went into some of the the, the values and literally the principles for cooperative. And I was going to highlight, you know, the first two: um, driving equitable growth and um, and um, voluntary and open membership and democratic member control. But but really, all of them lead to lead to um, social inclusion and and can be you know, use as education um, points for the cooperatives we work with globally um, and, and reminding them of what the principles are um, that they adhere to as a cooperative. So ed education is key, whether existing cooperatives we work with or new cooperatives are being formed um, on what it means and what the seven principles mean. So a little, a little scattered there, but those are, those are the key messages I wanted to get out before I lose you again. <laughs> No, that's brilliant. Thank you, Sarah. And, and uh, you know, there's a clear message, I think, from both of you there about the need for open and honest dialogue. And obviously the college potentially has a role to play there, but but only within the sort of partnerships that you're seeing evidence of today. And interestingly, one of the questions that's come in from uh, Andrew, uh, one of our guests today, was about um, how do we plan to continue this dialogue in future? And that's one that I don't have an easy answer to at the moment. It's clear that there is a real need to continue this dialogue so people understand the benefits and also the potential challenges. And our members in particular can understand ways in which they might be able to get involved in, in such important work. So, so that's, uh, yeah, that's fascinating. Thank you. And I'm going to go to another question that I've also um, teed up as well a little bit earlier as well and then come to one or two more quite quickly from the audience because I am acutely conscious of time so Danilo I'm going to come to you first with this one if it's okay because we sort of touched on a little bit earlier this this idea of of equality um, and potentially the challenges of working in societies where there are different approaches to equality that that we ourselves may not be familiar with or may not even be comfortable with you know how do how do we tackle those those kinds of issues um and should they do they get in the way of effective icd or do we need to find ways around them thank you neil it's not an easy question huh? but um maybe the the reply and the answer uh, relies on um the fact that uh, again we are a network so approaching uh, a development project or a different society, different culture, um, we had this uh, added value that we can count on a partner, a cooperative organization, at least in that country. So uh, entering um, the country with an international development cooperation project, uh, cooperative development project, um, 
I mean, uh, we have to 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 understand the environment, to to study the environment, and rely on uh, our uh, local partner in order uh, to understand how uh, our approach, our uh, project, uh, could fit uh, within that society. Uh, and uh, again, what Luan uh, uh, just said uh, is not uh, one size fits all, but uh, um, uh, adaptation, uh, personalization, tailored project, uh, and again, uh, the focus on partnership is the key uh, is the key um, fact uh, of uh, uh, development more in general international development and cooperative development because uh, again we are part of a network we have to use the network we have to um, respect uh, mm, let's say this um, entrepreneurial uh, biodiversity uh, in terms of uh, cooperative as uh, um, enterprises or uh, biodiversity of different actors uh, engaged in, in uh, international development and uh, understand the, 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 the community uh, in understanding the uh, local dimension is key in order to uh, be more effective and to address the challenges and the topics and the problems uh, in order to solve uh, inequalities. And then the storytelling, uh, and th thank you, Sarah, Sarah uh, Vicari for the acknowledgement. It's, it's another important factor because you have the opportunity using the net uh, to make people aware, more aware about the situation and to understand uh, better the situation uh that's uh, just from uh, reading or uh, posting or uh, i mean engaging uh, at local level is the is the key is the key factor and the uh, partnership should be uh, set up in this way with local partners and uh, uh, respecting uh, local cultures and uh, uh, in, engaging uh, donors and uh, external donors and stakeholders uh, with this uh, approach from my side, from my experience. Danilo, thank you. That was a, a fantastic answer. It was an answer, if you don't mind me saying, rooted in experience and also rooted in a, uh, I think, in a, in a really kind of equitable and, and values based approach. And I think we're all very grateful for that. And that's probably the hardest question of the day. So, also, thank you for, <laughs> for being willing to have a go at that one. Now, I'm always conscious of not wanting to run over and we have five minutes to go. There are three questions from the audience, all of which probably we could devote an hour to. I'm going to operate these in a quick fire round where I'm going to read the question out or at least summarise it and give panellists a maximum of one minute if there's anything that they would like to add in response to this question. I'm going to be really tight on time so we hear them all and we don't go over our time. First one's a question from Cam um, and it's an interesting question about any advice you would give to a researcher who's about to embark on a thesis focused on international cooperative development and how cooperative frameworks can close the gap and uphold justice. And the, the thing that really the, the meat of the question is, there are so many case studies out there. Is there any advice you can give on a particular place to start, something that might be a particularly good way into to understanding this and perhaps building a, a, a thesis around it? Anybody, any very short, sharp answers to that? Well, Cam, what I would say is um, that if you can drop us a line at the college and we'll have an email address at the end for you to contact us on we've got lots of academic partners that we work with and we may be able to point you in the direction of somebody who can offer um some specific advice on that from an academic perspective and i i feel yeah. a bit mean <clears throat> on the spot there neil can i just exactly jump in that, can i just jump oh, yeah. in though because one of the themes that we've been talking about quite a lot here has been networks and there are a lot of international property development networks. So we could definitely put them in touch with that. Networks yeah. are key to, you know, in terms of our work in Malawi, our networks with OCDC, our network, networks with DGRB are crucial. So that is a piece of research. So there is loads of responses to that. So Cam, it would be great. Please, and we'll put you in touch with people. 
Brilliant. Thank you, Sarah. Luann, well, did you? We'll talk. Uh, yeah, we have a cooperative research arm at OCDC. So connect. We'll connect and, and, and talk you. offline. Lots of ideas there. Yeah. Thank you so much. OK, question two of the three. Um, this is around coaching methods. And, um, the question is, can any of you comment on any particular coaching methods that have been used within ICD projects and whether any have worked particularly well or otherwise in particular countries at all? So coaching approaches and how they can unlock the past and maximize the present to deliver the future. Oh my goodness. I would say sometimes we coach so well that there's a brain drain issue. <laughs> so we, we, uh, we, we see a lot of our, our cooperative leaders who, who we work and nurture so well, and, and then they get, they could pulled into other directions of politics or, or whatnot. So it's good. It's a, a two edged sword there um, coaching. Um, but I think um, as as far as as tips, it's it's that co-op one on one training um, about the principles and about governance, and I and I think governance and, and practicing democracy is something that that we focus on, and um, making sure the members own the cooperative is is one of the one of the one of the key things that we have focused on at OCDC and in our members um, in, in supporting governance projects. So that's all I'll say. Yeah, thanks, Luan, and I think yeah, certainly my view would be that the method is perhaps less important than actually the values that underlie the approach really. And you've sort of encapsulated that much better than I might've done. So that was a question from Roland. Thank you for that. Last question to take from the audience and literally we have 30 seconds, but it's, a, again, we could spend an hour on this. Many donors want to see quick return on investment and we know successful co-op development can take years. So how do we win over skeptics to be patient? I'm gonna suggest an answer to this, which is the very, quick response but I think that the storytelling approach is so important because I think the storytelling approach can actually allow you to start to show evidence of impact almost from day one and actually you know, building in milestones which would allow for impact to be measured really really quickly and to be told in a rich way which perhaps shows there are more benefits um, than, than the simple end aims that a funder might have had in the first place could be a solution to this. And sorry, that's probably your experience of, of a storytelling approach. Yeah, and in fact, I mean, after this uh, around the world trip, uh, we also, ourselves, we were kind of impressed about uh, how this could be used also in a developing, in the international corporate development uh, projects. That was uh, one of the, our thinking, internal thinking, because uh, it's it's a tool for donors to see to, to tell the world what they're doing, but at the same time uh, is a most importantly is a tool for the community to see and and share and so and create knowledge about what they are doing before sharing, create a common knowledge. Brilliant, thank you. And that was a question from Zoraida, so thank you for that one. We are right up at time, so. Very briefly, some next steps. For those of you who aren't already members of the college, we do have a range of ways you can get involved as either individual or organisational members. I think it's clear that there is a dialogue that we've started today and we could continue and we could develop and we're really keen to involve our members in that. Um, we do also offer lots of opportunities to continue your learning. You'll find some self-paced short courses on our website. Um, we work specifically with organisations on bespoke training um, and maybe most interestingly for people who know as well are our new partnership programmes in higher education. We've been running one for a year now with Imperial College London, but also coming soon and please watch this space is a master's level partnership specifically um, themed around cooperatives and cooperation with the University of Dundee. So please watch this space. Um, all of you who've joined us today, thank you so much for doing so. We will let you know ways in which you can stay in touch with us, potentially ask some more tricky questions as well. Um, and there'll be a feedback email with a questionnaire um, coming to you soon. And finally, my, my final opportunity to, to put us in the, uh, in the window is that the next one of these events, I hope will be just as thought provoking, but with a slightly different theme. Um, and we will be looking at youth and potentially um, looking at some of the challenges UK and worldwide um, around youth violence and some of the uh, the impacts that that can have 
um, on particular, particularly on disadvantaged young people. Um, that will be coming in the first quarter of 2023, and we will keep you posted about that um, as we firm up a date and firm up what I hope will be another um, fantastic panel, although I think they'll have some big boots to fill after uh, the performance of our amazing panellists today. So I'm going to finish very quickly with some thanks. Um, of course, thanks to uh, Sara and to Luan and to Danilo for being such wonderful panellists. Thank you to my colleague Sarah for um, her, her, her great facilitation of that discussion. Thank you also to all my colleagues behind the scenes. This has taken some planning. Uh, lots of people working in our comms and in our IT um, and our business development teams to make sure that this hopefully looked um, as if it went smoothly from your side. It feels like it did from our side. Uh, and finally, to everybody who's joined um, as a participant today, um, clearly there was so much to talk about. It perhaps wasn't as interactive as it might have been, but loads of you have asked questions. I'm conscious that we haven't answered one or two. We'll do our very best to get back to you. Um, but thank you for joining us because you've been a really important part of today. And at that point, with a final thank you, I will wish you all farewell and hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.